Hey guys, and welcome to Leadership Line of Sight. Excited to be here and excited to uh, bring the two of you here. I'm here with uh, Scott Connors, as always. Scott, Chief Change Officer of Crankset Group. He's helping CEOs make the changes and really like a lot of its adaptation to what's currently going on. You know, every day seems to be something a little bit different. And we're also joined by David Freed. David is the, uh, now you've got a few titles. You've got talent excellence leader at Amazon, right? But also chief innovation officer. And uh, you're a PhD candidate as well. Mm -mm. So the first. Mm -mm. Not a PhD candidate. He's a doctor now. What? Yeah. That's the last time we talked. Uh, somebody gets to introduce you to the public is uh, Dr. David Freed. Yeah, first one. Yeah. <laughs> this, is a big, this is a big moment. It's a big That's moment. That's a huge achievement. Congratulations. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. You yeah feel great. You, yeah, it does. It does. And it's brought on a lot of the new titles as I'm talking to leaders and I'm talking to people out there. It's uh, it's bringing a lot of exciting opportunities along with it. So really, really pumped to be here to uh, to be chatting with each of you and and get get some uh, news out there. So let's dig into that right out of the gate. Yeah. So talk to us about like this milestone. So you were building a version of you, right? Like that's mm -hmm. what we always see with these growth movements. So what did you really feel as though you were developing, and what uh, like? what do you feel as though this moment kind of indicates or, or allows you to do next? Yeah. So, so this moment kind of brings together my entire career. So I've, as I was looking back uh, towards the beginning of this year, looking back over my career, I've done a lot of things, right? I've been, uh, I, I was the eighth corporate employee of Massage Envy and I started in the very first location. Um, I, I then I've gone into the mortgage industry and worked in, in, uh, continuous improvement in the mortgage industry. I've worked in government contracting with the largest government contractor for photo enforcement uh, in the world and, and helped them do a lot of different things, actually continuous improvement and, and customer engagement um, and a lot of different things in there in that world. Uh, and at Amazon have, have done a lot of different things, worked in customer service in the legal department um, and uh, in HR. And the thread that I found through all of those things was innovation. And that, uh, that came out as I was looking at the topic in, uh, of my dissertation, which is creating a roadmap to help leaders innovate. There's lots of great theories. There's lots of great books. There's high level stuff, but there's nothing that says, hey, leaders, here's how you create innovation. And the other thing about it, about it that, that it's not just a roadmap, it's actually a cycle because innovation has to be cyclical. You can innovate once, and if you don't ever innovate again, you go away. And so innovation is a constant. And so my research and the really cool leaping off point that, that I'm at right now is um, in addition to understanding the elements of, of innovation from a leader's perspective, um, I also understood the market that we're in by talking to leaders. So my, my study was uh, mixed. So it's qualitative and quantitative. So I used some different qualitative tools or uh, quantitative tools but I also interviewed almost 30 C-suite leaders from around the world, organizations of all different sizes, and talked to them about how they lead for innovation and got insights into success and what that looks like and how they create it, how they measure it, um, and what's necessary to create success in this new world that we're living in, this new environment that we were talking about the last time I was on of, of rapid change, constant uncertainty. You know, one of the big differentiators, successful innovators do not say when we get back to, when we get back to the office, when we get back to this, when we get back to pre-COVID, when we get back, that's not in their vocabulary. And so it's that helping leaders understand what leadership for innovation really is. And that's where it's been really great because a lot of leaders have approached me about that. I'm working on a book that's going to talk about that and lay out the roadmap. Um, and I get to have great conversations with, with innovators such as yourselves who are looking at this saying, leadership now is more critical than ever. And that's why I really love chatting with you, with you gentlemen. I love that uh, um, the innovation is cyclical. There's a cycle to it. 
the work that I do with companies, I have what I call the innovation circle. You innovate, you absorb, and as you're absorbing, you're learning. Mm-hmm. What what we learn? What do we need to innovate? Absorb the change, learn from it, innovate. So we're always in one of those three places in our conversations, not only at the leadership level, but throughout the enterprises, right? So it's, Absolutely. it's, it, it, it's a consistent, it's like gravity, right? After a while, you, you can't feel it, but it's definitely there. And I yeah. think the innovation circle, more than anything in, in, in what we've been through, what we're going through now, supply chain and inflation and scarcity and, and those things in the marketplace, it's the same cycle, right, David? Mm-hmm. It's just running yeah. faster. It's just running yeah. faster, right? And That's, so if you can get kind of in that rhythm as a company and, and have good culture, game on. Absolutely, Scott. Absolutely. You, you hit on one of the other key points, right, is the speed at which this th- these things go. So um, when I chat with leaders and I talk about, hey, what are you, you know, tell me about your, um, your strategy sessions and, and when you're chatting with your team, your, your direct reports, um, and when they're having conversations with their teams, about the uh, identifying that opportunity to innovate, right? Exactly that 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 cycle that you discussed. Um, when are they having that? And those people that are saying, "Oh, we do it quarterly," or or that's part of our annual planning process. I say, okay. So tell me the rate of change in your business. Tell me the last time you had to adapt something or change something because uh, the market changed, right? We're we're running at a clip that's now. Um, COVID took it from annually to, you know, chunks of months, six to nine month periods. Uh, 2021 has shown us that it's moving monthly or faster, where things are changing, new things are introduced, there's a new scarcity, there's a new um, issue. And we discussed this at length before, it's not about problem solvers anymore. It's about problem identification. What are you looking at? How are you identifying the things that are going to be that next thing and getting in front of that so that you can meet your customers or beat your customers there and offer them that next leg up? And that's really a lot of that insight. And that's it's a lot of leaders are getting it. Um, the ones at least that are that are reaching out and asking are understanding it and they want to learn more, which is the really cool part um, to, to having these conversations. So what I want to learn a little bit more about is um, the people that let's say that <clears throat> most people can't actually recognize solutions because they're living in their problem. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if, if I was someone who is like, man, I'm uncertain as to whether or not I'm a leader that is um, creating an environment that fosters innovation. What are the most likely things I'm going to, I'm doing right now that would stifle that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me let me jump in here. Yeah, yeah. No, I've, please I, do. I've got some I've got some right here right now kind of this morning kind of stuff going on that's worked out really well. So what what leaders need is a tool. A very simple tool that they can use that'll kind of grab that nebulousness that's out there and and that problem spotting and identifying and and that team approach to that. And so what I've done is I've designed actually a tool, a very simple tool I call it C3. And it's where we come together, whomever might be in the problem solving or spotting or whatever that team is, we come together and we have a conversation in three steps. Step number one is concept. Hey guys, I I got this concept. I think we're going to have a problem getting refrigerators to that home building site next month. And here's why I think that's going to be a problem. We're supposed to ship last week. They didn't. And here's what I'm hearing from the port. So the concept is we're going to have problems. Everybody agree we have a problem there. If everybody agrees that the concept is valid, that we spotted something here, well, then we can have clarity. All right, let's talk about what do you mean late? Late getting there, late getting installed. What clarity, what port is it? You know, oh, I know that port. My uncle is a manager there. Let me make a call. So we get clarity around the concept. But concept can be anything, anything. So it's a place where we can come together and go, all right, here's what I'm working on. I got a couple of concepts I need to run by the team. Just open space communication. And then from there, we get clarity. Ask the questions. Lean into the questions. Like what questions come up around this concept? And if we have concept and we have clarity, and then we go to C3, and that's consensus. Do you guys think that we should pre-purchase 
uh, 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 refrigerators for the next subdivision, for the next master plan community today and open up that supply chain, finance, weigh in on this. So now we have consensus, right? And then there's only, thing one there's only one thing left to do, right, David? You got concept, you got clarity, you got consensus, execute. Execute. Yep. That's interesting. So I <clears throat> I came across the same concept a few years ago that was worded to me a different way. And I like your wording, Scott. The one that uh, I came across was OODA loops, and it was from fighter pilots. And they do observe, orient, decide, and then act. And the thing that I really like that you highlighted there is, is that uh, outlining the concept, like giving it that scope to begin with, and then going back to look again and like see things as clearly as possible. Uh, that's definitely something that I'll, I'll have as a takeaway. David, what do you think that leaders are doing to stifle? Uh, like, what are the things that you think that a leader that's ready for a change could do to look around their business and realize that they may be stifling innovation? Yeah. So first, real quick, before I get to stifling, just leaders, take a second, rewind to what Scott just said, and write all of that down. Because yeah. that is the first step in this process. And if you are not doing it, you are not... It, you are already behind, right? So that's, that's number one. Um, I think uh, the biggest thing that leaders do to stifle um, is they think about that process that Scott just went through from their perspective, from them. They're the ones doing it. Uh, they, as a leader, you don't have all the information you need to, to do that well. So you need to bring people together. You need to create an environment where um, people are bringing that to you, where you're, it's, it's coming in almost real time. If somebody spots a potential issue or an opportunity, even more so than an issue, if someone spots an opportunity, you need to have that um, mechanism that they can get that to you and execute that. C I love that C3. It, it, that's, that's step number one, if you're not doing that. Um, and so part of that, is two things. A lot of times leaders are so focused on cost that they're not focused on, uh, so they're focused on efficiencies, right? How can we be super efficient? But it, you can't be efficient. It's actually a paradigm. It's called organizational ambidexterity. You, it, it's the balance of efficiency and agility. And how do you balance those two things and create a space where your teams have the freedom to work on what they need to work on based on that C3 that Scott just went through, when you identify something and you have consensus, you can't have finance or somebody always killing something. Not every idea is gonna get lift off. It's, you can't spend all of your capital on one thing, right? But understanding what's behind it and, and then going through that process again to say, how are we going to then prevent this from becoming an issue? What parameters can we live within? So balancing that efficiency uh, which tends to be related to either cost or, or quality, right, with agility. And that is a really tough balance. And most leaders aren't, aren't focused on creating that balance. They're either one or the other. You have your entrepreneurial CEOs that forget costs. We're going to spend whatever we need to spend. We're going to make this thing happen. We're going to grow this business. That's not healthy either. That drives, that drives your employees crazy right? They feel like they're constantly chasing the tail and, and they don't know where we're, where we're going. They don't have direction. They don't feel consistency. Um, and so it, it truly is a balance. I think that's one of the big ones. The other, uh, the other big one that, that stifles is organizational complexity. So much bureaucracy exists that kills the ability to innovate. And there are tools out there to use um, we talked about the speed, right? If, if you're doing everything through email, um, we've all been a part of the reply all mess, right? Where leader sends out an email, three different individuals reply all, and now you have three different email strings and you're trying to keep all the thoughts together and, and every, you're already inefficient. You're losing, you're, you're done. So there are great, um, tools that, that help with that, but that's part of organizational complexity. What are you as a leader driving in the behavior of your people to make their lives easier? If you can make it easier for them to do this stuff, they're going to do it more and more and more. 
and you're going to win more and more and more, right? Like the more you can do C3, Scott, the more you're going to win, right? Like that's, that's how it goes. So exactly. Although, although put an, put an epitaph on that, put a gravestone, a grave marker on that with me and tell, tell, and I love when you tell this story, but tell the story about two way door decisions. Oh yeah. Yeah. Real quick. Sorry. A little, little power issue here. Two way door decisions, right? So, um, your one way doors are something where they're non reversible, right? You can't get them back once you've made that decision. Two way doors, and I love the way Scott says this, right? You fail forward. Two way doors are your fail forward opportunities. There, it's an acceptable risk to take it and to go and launch and grow and be successful in something that's fully reversible. Or what in my world, I, I see two way doors as not reversible, but you take what you learned and you iterate. Right. And you find the next successful thing and you go out and test that. And then you go find the next successful thing and you test that and you will test enough that I mean, you look at the successful CEOs and innovators of our time. Right. The Bezos, the, the Steve Jobs, that's what they do. They don't ever get it right the first time. We just don't see the hundred failures leading up to the iPhone. Right. Or the whatever it is that they're doing. We don't see those. Um, they're there. They certainly exist. And so uh, that's, you know, that's something it, it's creating a space for your people to be psychologically safe to fail as long as they're failing forward. And you're doing so in a way that when they do, when they're saying, hey, I have an idea, getting really crisp about how you're going to measure those things, who you're going to measure and what you're looking at, because then you go and you say, OK, we had eight success criteria. Five of them were met, three of them weren't. Great. We're going to keep doing those five things that were successful. Now let's just tweak the three instead of going and saying, we have this big anomalous thing we're going to do. And now we have to try to figure out why we weren't successful with it. Right. Um, and that's something that's the role of the leader in the room. And I think, too, like there was a you brought up a really great point, Taylor. Leaders and managers. Right. They're the same person. You manage the here and now based on the problems, the pain points, you've got to improve your, you've got to work in the now. Leadership is about opportunity in the future. It's about identifying, it's creating that space to help your team get you there and, and casting that vision and creating that safe space for people to fail forward and, and iterate on that while you're managing. So you've got a dual role there. There's a, a, every manager should be a leader and every leader should be a manager. Um, and it's knowing when to play what roles, right? I totally agree. And like <clears throat> in my own businesses, I have small businesses and there's a few things that uh, I like hearing back from the both of you, because honestly, this is an incredibly selfish show here where I sit down with two people that just teach me uh, and I, I hoodwink you guys. Uh, but in my own businesses, what I noticed is one, um, selling people on the vision is like uh, what we used to think it was, but now it's more so just sitting and talking about that to s so they can see what you see. That's like a big thing that people want from leadership. And then being able to regulate your energy, this was something I learned from uh, from dogs, actually. Dogs don't choose the most energetic or aggressive to be the leader. It's the one that's stable energy. Nobody can follow the other ones. They don't make decisions the right way. You want somebody that can do that. And, and being someone who has a plan qualifies you to be a leader. The other thing is, is the person that everybody defines as help. That person also is qualified as a leader. And so then there's the other parts of it where we talk about the management side. And I think that we should take a look at like management as being like a present statement. So imagine that like anxiety is living too much in the future, dis uh, depression is living too much in the past. And so the value of presence of mind is the freedom from those two things. And imagine that if you were managing someone, what we determine is like micromanaging is when you're managing their present. Whereas coaching is managing their future. Uh -huh. And those things I think are, are like the, the things that I'm happy to hear because having these little processes, even though I just like got 2.0 from Scott, you know, I had something that was like that, but a big part of it also is decision process. Like, you know how, uh, David, you were mentioning, like, let's set some criteria. Mm -hmm. 
like I often talk to my team about saying, let's live uh, at our success point for a moment and look back to where we are. Yeah. What had to happen for, for us to get here? And what was the most likely thing that was going to overcome us and we wouldn't have made it? Yeah, I just find that that's something that allows people to like, uh, uh, I guess, see things the way I see things because I'm constantly like inverting things and flipping them inside out. Uh, I can see that uh, there's a few things here to comment on. Go ahead, dig in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want Scott to comment on the uh, the selling on the vision because he's got some interesting thoughts that we've discussed on on that part. So I want him to comment on that. But what you're describing, Taylor, is is actually a part of a Six Sigma process, right? So there's the Six Sigma for uh, which everybody's t- most people are typically familiar with for fixing something. But there's also a really great, and it's actually my favorite process. Um, which is for building something new. And it's, it's doing exactly what you did. It's reverse engineering from an end state. And you say what has to happen. And I used to actually, with, with different organizations, um, we would sit and we'd I'd design this thing the whole bit and we'd have a really great you know, uh, project plan and we'd have this process and we'd, all right, here's the tech and here's all these things that we're gonna build out. And I would look around the table and i say, okay, everybody do me a favor, write down the top three reasons this is gonna fail. Let's go Mythbusters on this thing. I want to know what's going to kill this. And if there's 10 people around the table, you get 30 ideas. A couple are redundant, which is great. A couple of them are pretty obvious. And it's like, okay, but they're said. So they're not hiding in the background. One or two are complete from the shadows. And you're going, that wasn't even on our radar before. I used to reward those people. I, that was the stuff I would recognize in emails to our leadership team in the hey project status stuff just so you know the group came up with these top five killers and look at number one and two i'd like to recognize these people for for bringing that up because overcoming these this would have been a huge detriment to this project and i just want to give them props for for um coming up with that the amount of creative energy that came from doing that um it was a game people used to come in ready for it sometimes i would throw you know toss around candy bars and stuff for like the best ideas in a meeting and have some fun with it. But that's the, that's exactly it. Taylor is you get to that end state and you say, okay, where are we? What does it look like? How are we functioning? Tell me about what we're doing operationally and then work backwards from that. And what had to happen? Okay. What had to happen first? Then what, and you just create it. That's your project milestones. There's project plans. You make them as you go based on the roadmap you're designing. So, um, Anyway, it's a really well, it's called DFSS or Design for Six Sigma. If anybody's interested, there's a ton of great books on it. I recommend anything from uh, Dr. Michael Harry. He was the co-architect of Six Sigma and and his stuff is really legit on the process. That was how I did my black belt. I I designed Massage Envy Supply Chain. We actually designed an alternate business because we realized we were doing it so well, we could sell to Massage Envy's competitors. And we did for a decade. Um, we ran that business. It was a $130 million business at 34% profit. Um, it, it was extremely profitable and extremely well run. We innovated um, with a company called NetSuite, a tech company. And we c- came up with a unique uh, tool that they actually made part of their ERP, their natural ERP. And I mean, they sold to Oracle, I think, in 2016 for like $4 billion. So, you know, I really wish I would have bought stock when I was working yeah. with them. But we created this brand new, so based on, so you and I log into a website, right? We see the same price as Amazon. We go to Amazon, we look up the same book, you and I see the same price, right? So now go to this other, this other website. Um, I'm a massage envy franchisee, you own a spa in California, right? So I'm buying a lot more than you are. So when I log in, my prices automatically change on every product. Every product was unique. So I got to see the best pricing. You got level two pricing and so forth. And we had four levels of pricing based on how you logged in. And nobody had done that back in 2004 and five when when um, the VP of IT and I built this for, for Massage Envy. And we, we ran that business for a decade. Uh, so anyway, I, I want to turn it over That's to Scott. Awesome. Though. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, but Scott, I know Scott and I've had conversations on selling the vision and, and you know, or bringing people to the vision. And I, I want his thoughts on that comment because I love where he comes from with that. And one second, because I definitely want to hear that. But to put that in context, did you say that you were employee number eight at Massage Envy? Yeah. 
Yeah, so you were employee number eight into a startup that sold for four billion dollars. So um, the the so Massage Envy sold for a few hundred million um, when they sold to private equity, and they sold four times um, in different private equities um, over their time. The tech company that we used to build this this secondary company for Massage Envy, because in franchising you can have. Uh, secondary company, so the franchisor could have a secondary company. So I was basically a consultant to the CEO, and I, the VP and IT and I built this company. I did a voice of the customer, found out all their pain points, and designed this endpoint solution. And he knew how to make it happen from a tech side. And so we built this company in eight months, got it fully up and running, and became the largest distributor in the massage industry within the first ninety days of our. Uh, of our being being on the planet, you know, or being in existence, and uh, worked with all the top vendors and and revolutionized what they were doing for distribution and supply chain for a decade. I left in uh, 2013, and and the VP of IT left in 2014. And Massage Envy's latest ownership group is also owned by the largest network of hospital suppliers. So that was the only industry that could beat what we were doing because they, they get all those things to supply the hospitals and stuff. So they absorb massage envy and, and close down the doors on that supply chain and use their own supply chain. But Well, that's amazing. And like, there's a quote from uh, Connor McGregor. He says, I'm not here to take part. I'm here to take over and talk about like sweeping in 90 days. That's massive. Now, Scott, you are like, when you, the vision is something that's so important. So scoping it and then uh, basically helping uh, other people see what you see. Take us into that. Well, I think the concept of vision has changed uh, rapidly. Uh, and first of all, we need to you know, introduce the concept of two visions. One is wh wh where do we need to get to in the next two, three, four quarters? That's a visionary statement and not a mission statement. Um, we need to be here. We need a, a threshold here. We need X. We need this many to land on X, whatever it is. There's something that needs to drive the company for the next 120, 150 days. Uh, you know, the Japanese, they review their business plans. I believe it's every six months. Um, I'm looking at revisions every three months. You know, how far do we get? How far are we along? What else do we have to do to get this path? We, we really got to eat the elephant one bite at a time right now. And so vision's more about let's get here and then we'll go back to revisiting the long-term vision because of the disruptions um, and the moonshot piece that we're in now. Uh, but as far as vision goes, it's funny you'd mentioned entrepreneurial uh, leaders versus, you know, more of a bureaucratic leader. Uh, the mistake that most leaders make and most big companies definitely make is they set the vision from the top down. It, it, just let that sit. And what they're saying is get on the bus, we'll pay to come along and here's where we're going. They never take down, hey, does that sound fun? Sound like a good place you'd like to go? Can we get your participation along the way? Maybe take a couple shifts driving along the way? Yeah. You know, it's a long trip. We'd love to have you around. Is that going to work? Does this work for you? We don't have those conversations in recruiting. We don't have them in training and development. We don't have them in day-to-day. -day. We don't ever visit a vision mission. We don't ever, we don't ever vi look at a vision statement within organizations. Sure, you go to the website and it's pretty. It sounds good. It's crap. It's what it is because it was built from the top down and visions are achieved from the ground up. So walk with your people and ask them what the vision is. Cause we all get a pass right now. We all get a, a reset button right now. Okay. Pre COVID we had a vision, but boy, whew, things have sure have changed. Now, where do you think we might want to go? Where would you like us to go? And the amount of concept conversations that you have around that it's engaging. It's fun. To be in a room with the CEO and, and 60, 80 people virtually and some in person now that we're getting back in the office. Hey, guys, let's work on our vision together. You know, and it's and it's, it, you know, it's it's those low, people that find themselves lower on the work track go. Us? You want a vision? Wait, what? And, and that creates an engagement atmosphere and that creates a participation age atmosphere. And that helps us decide on a joint vision. So you don't have to sell vision. They've sold it themselves to you. And if you like it, sure, let's go to Disneyland. It's only 6,000 miles. Everybody's got chip in for gas. Are we taking a old school bus or would y'all like to take a nice plane? Well, we want to take a plane. Well, then we better grow sales quickly. 
because we're going to need to buy a plane. You see that all just starts to come together now into those things that, oh, revenue targets are met. Hmm, interesting. Wonder where that came from. And so we want to build our visions from the ground up as best we can. The only way to do that is very simple. Take the ego out of it. Start from a place of I'm going to listen, to learn. The ideas are in this room. It's my job to get them out and decide where we're all going to go with consensus. Now, is everybody going to agree? Consensus doesn't mean everybody agrees 100%. It means that a lot, a lot of people in that room are doing the bobblehead. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds good. Let's be that. Let's do that. So if you're an accounting firm, maybe we just want to be a really fun place to work. Right? If we're a janitorial supply company, let's be a really safe place to work. Right? Where do you want to do? Cast that vision and make it part of the greater good. That's where the greater good combines operational security and, and where it thrives. That's awesome. And when you take a look at like traveling with other people, in some way you're saying that previously to now, it, you were taking like a ship full of hostages. Right. Right. And so it's much different than if you were taking a ship full of people that were invested in, in the destination. That's How, exactly it, right. Yeah. And things are going to get so hard that the hostages are going to have to help. But how much do you help when you're not connected to the plan? Right. And if you say, hey, we're going to be a $10 billion enterprise, and then you have a big party because you made it to a billion. Everybody's there. But how many people are going, what about me? Yeah. And those targets really wouldn't necessarily resonate with everybody. That's right. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that was exactly like, Scott, you hit on it, right? Is if you have to sell your vision, it's not the right vision, right? People should see your vision and go, I want to be a part of that. So the, the demand is there that people are fighting to join your organization. And we've talked about, you know, like attracting and retaining top, top talent, right? If you're doing and, and leaders, again, I'm going to pause, rewind and just re-listen and take really good notes of what Scott just said. <laughs> Because that's gold in terms of how you get people, how you cast that. There were so many things in there. Multiple visions. Absolutely. You have your, your ideal vision of what your, what your organization is trying to do in the world. The dent you want to make in the world. But if you're not looking at things at the 60, 90 day clip, your vision, by the, by the time you've set that and you're driving toward it, you're going to get a detour. You're not going to get there, right? There's road construction you don't know about. There's a road closure. There's an accident, right? That's going to detour you. The world is moving too fast to set an annual vision anymore and just think that's good enough. It's good to have that ideal though and create that thing that people want to join in and people want to be a part of and that there's so much demand to work at your organization because people want to belong to that, um, that there's never a hostage on there. You're not, nobody's going to agree on everything, but when you create that atmosphere, people will disagree, but then they'll say, but you know what? I'm okay with that. And I still want to be on this bus and I'm going, let's go, you know, and, and they'll, they'll be right there with you. And you've got great people doing it and you'll have the, the top talent to choose from uh, because that resonates. So, yeah. yeah. And, and keep, keep it simple, right? Like, let me give you a, let me give you a hypothetical example. You're, you're a defense contractor and you have this product that's going to keep the soldiers safer, Right. Well, the big, the other big players in the defense contracting industry, they don't want this to get out. They don't, they, 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 they want to crush you. So they're going to sue you for patent infringement and state court and federal court and labor laws. I mean, they're coming, right? And these are big, big players. It's, you're a little guy and you've got this great piece of equipment. Let's call it a helmet. Okay. Boy, we just, we got to, we got to crush these guys, right? Because innovation, when you're a nation state actor, big actor, you don't want innovation because you you already own the marketplace. Well, don't start playing in my playground because we're going to, we're going to land on you, right? So, so, so vision's important for the companies. They're getting hammered. This company's getting hammered with bad press and then it doesn't work. It's safe or whatever, right? But it works and it's a great product and the people there believe in it. So what's that vision statement? I'll just give you the example, make it very simple for everybody forward. Our vision statement is forward. No matter how hard we get hit, we're just going to keep moving forward. 
because we come from defense. We, we were soldiers. We want this technology to make it so that the, so that our, you know, that our brothers are safer. And no matter what hits us, no matter how hard, no matter how many angles forward. So every decision in that company is based on forward. So instead of it being, Oh gosh, we're served again. It's whatever. Here's legal go. And so everybody's got the blinders on going forward. So vision is simple. It's not hard. It just has to be the right thing to do that everybody can buy into. And it comes from the bottom up. If we find that simple one, two, three, four words, that's our vision. And that's something that <clears throat> I found was really effective in helping me um, recruit people. Uh, not only would it explain to them what made sense, but it would also help me say, is this person, like, for example, one of our core principles is steadfast teammate. So it's how we want you to treat us. But another one is compassionate advisor to our clients. And that should come with a standard of not just taking instructions but filtering them through your expertise and delivering it back. These things like helped us basically tell if the people that we were working with were living what our company was about, because if there is inconsistency in that, or even like when you talk about the frequency that these things are entered, like the, the amount of time that people need. So Scott, you touched on natural cadence. So you were saying that uh, uh, the amount of months, like I'm on an, uh, I believe in a natural cadence in 90 days. I think that if the plan isn't reviewed every 90 days, I totally agree with you. It's like at 93 days, it's the Etch-A-Sketch has been shaken or something, but uh, nobody remembers the plan. But then to drill it down and say, okay, well, how often do we have to talk to each other? And what can we talk to people about that would be a good way for them to express themselves? One of the things that I found in how we start our huddles is what are you grateful for? Normally, what are you grateful for? And uh, I'll have a question about... Um, uh, the people in general, like yesterday, it was what makes you laugh the most. And that helps us to really get an alignment. And then we'll notice in the beginning of the meeting that someone has trouble uh, finding an example of gratitude, huge symptom to me, like they're expressing overwhelm in most cases. Uh, and when they think about something that makes them laugh, if they're really detached from thinking about making, like thinking about laughing, that should be a statement to me. Right. But if I just ask them, like, are you happy? And <laughs> how's your capacity today? Uh, it's just not going to work. It's like I'm using the wrong program for that, so like wrong software for that hardware. Hmm. It's, well, and that's exactly those the two sets of questions are managerial and leadership. The are you happy today or are, do you have capacity today is managerial. You're in the present, you're in the moment. And sometimes that needs to be asked. Um, but the leadership questions of, um, you know, that you're digging, like, what are you grateful for and things like that, that that's transformative. That's where people should be. You know, they look back and reflect living in the moment, thinking about the future. It can come from any one of those spaces. So it's a great blend of those two activities, but it's, a, and it's a great start to, to that dialogue. Right. Yeah. And, and you know what, if you want to lead, listen, all right there and 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 don't be a bad actor if you don't have empathy you're done retire find a replacement or figure out how you become empathetic and and come listen companies worldwide are figuring that out right now leaders are figuring all that out right now they're adjusting you know we got a ton of brilliant minds in leadership uh in in, in companies throughout the world and and they're recognizing these things and they're adapting and you're watching some really good stories out there unfold in the world today and of leadership and inclusion. And, you know, you're also seeing some of these investment firms uh, really start to get active in private capital uh, company. I was at an investor conference virtually this week with rain tree capital, rain tree financial solutions at Edmonton, great group. And they're in the wealth preservation business, the wealth expansion business, and then the private equity business where they actually take wealth and, and, and create opportunities in the entrepreneurial sector. Uh, and, and Edmonton and Canada could use a lot more of that type of capital, and they recognize that. 
And their CEO was 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 uh, going through the opening, kicking off the conference, and he gave five concepts. And he was talking about one of them being stimulus in the market. It's a government stimulus, one of Taylor's favorite conversations. And he gave he gave a great example of uh, driving a manual uh, vehicle, and you put your foot on the clutch, and how you let that clutch out and engage that gas. Well, if if we if we too much stimulus pulls back, obviously we'll sputter forward. And if we keep the clutch down too much and push the gas, and we'll be revving too high. And he was talking about finding that balance, and that balance really resonated. I think it resonated well with the investors that were on the on the conference uh, calls uh, and in the breakout sessions from what I attended. But it, but it, but take that concept to leading your company, right? Don't walk in and have the clutch down and your hand foot on the accelerator and go, how's everybody today? Gosh, that sounds really great. And the people are looking around going, yeah, right. So integrity, be who you are, stay with your style, but either learn to be empathetic and learn how important empathy is or let somebody else take that role. That's, that's really great. What was the name of that company again, Scott? Yeah, Raintree Capital, Raintree Financial Solutions. Uh, they're out of Edmonton. Great group. That's my neck of the woods. And uh, that sounds like a really good approach. The uh, um, Honestly, when you take a look at all the government help in the marketplace, it's changing the competitive landscape. This is why you're referring to uh, why I think that this is, you know, why I like this topic, right? And I think that, you know, have you ever noticed anybody who came into a whole bunch of money? Like, it doesn't change them. It magnifies them. So if they were awesome, they're more awesome. If they were awful, they're more awful. And the same thing in this is that you're going to end up with companies that are getting financial help and then they don't hunt anymore. You know, like the, uh, the these these ebbs and flows, like being able to regulate that. The How are we going to take this to people under 30 years old? They don't really drive the cars anymore. Like... Uh, <laughs> You know, the, the idea of those types of movements, that, that analogy is perfect for some, but understanding that, uh, that's something that I'm very attached to, like having motorcycles and riding and racing and things like that. Uh, I love it. That's a, that's a great way to put it. So rain tree is from my neck of the woods as well. Uh, and that's fantastic that they have such a strong understanding. Yeah. And David, let me ask you a question this week. Uh, uh, Quite a lot of news out there, uh, big companies. Um, uh, you know, we talk about the great resignation. Um, you know, everybody's hiring. Uh, we're starting to see some of these bank reports come out. Like Chase and Goldman came out with reports. It's like, yeah, it's not that we have a supply chain issue. It's that Americans have bought so much of everything, you know, and, and up in Canada, supply chain issues are, are relatively the same. Um uh, and so there's all this money, you know, all this liquidity, this consumer liquidity, which is causing, you know, the workforce to kind of take a break or retire or lean back a little bit. Um, uh, definitely a hot button in my world this week of, of hiring and recruiting. Uh, it, here's a question for you. It's kind of a loaded one. How important is the decision making? That someone's going to move from company A to company B in the culture of that company how important is culture in whether i'm going to go work for this company or stay at this company yeah that's that is a great question and uh if you say it's loaded if you're if you're wondering what the answer is let's talk um <laughs> it, it, it it is everything right now it is it, it is absolutely everything um it is a function of uh the trust, the attachment to the vision, uh, your relationship with your peers and your managers, all of that is playing into um, where people want to be. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the really crux for the movement is culture, where people are getting, um, they've identified, they were forced into something where they've identified uh, that they like something they had never tried before, whether it was working remotely or variable schedules, uh, whatever that may be, understanding, you know, having a relationship with their, with their leader where they're not in the same office and they can't just walk over and you talk about accessibility, you talk about empathy, um, communicating that and, and showing that virtually can be a challenge. And so 
people are being drawn to those areas. And it's exactly like we were talking before, right? When you create something that people want to flock to, people are equally leaving something they don't want to be a part of, but they're not just going to the next thing. They're going to somewhere they want to be a part of. So it's not, I'm just going to go try out this other option. And so when you look at and you, you start to get into some of these numbers that get published and things when it comes to like employee size growth and things like that, these organizations that experienced a lot of that learn from what they do culture wise. That's where your good people, if you see people resigning from your org that are people you enjoyed working with, find out where they're going and look at that company culture and say, what are they doing that my peers want to go be a part of? And right. I should be doing that here, right? right. And that's, the, that's one of the most critical pieces. Um, people are the most critical things. Again, whether it's innovation, leading an organization, very few successful organizations at scale, which is, I know, Scott, one of your favorite areas, are one person, that, right? So you need people. And if you think you don't need people, again, let's talk, because yeah. you do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it, it's a whole cycle and the leader needs to create the space for this cycle, whether it's the C3 at the beginning or this entire continuous, um, continuous innovation cycle. It, it's the leaders creating the space for these things and setting some expectation and cr creating the opportunity, but they're not the one doing it. They just right. have to create the space so their people can do it. And that's, that's what people are craving. So, well, really I, I took, yeah, and you know what I did? I, I had enough of the kind of dancing around and and moving moving culture a little bit quickly enough because the wheel's spinning faster now. I, I'd really had enough, so we just started spinning up culture clubs, and it's just basically email. Hey, we want to have a better culture because it doesn't matter if you have the best culture in the world, you still want it to be better. That's what made it so good to begin with. Culture club, whoever wants to be in it, set up the work group, meet Tuesday at five or Friday at four from drinks and. You know, that kind of thing. We did some, some DoorDash and some Uber Eats to get some food out there for people. How can we make the culture better? No yes. rules, no budget, no box. Don't think inside the box. Don't think outside the box. No box. How can we make it better? What can we do? And when you've got this consensus and this clarity and this concept around better culture, don't tell us what we're doing wrong. I, I don't want to hear about wrong. Right. Right. And it's easy. It's an easy leadership play right there. I want to hear what you guys want to do. You want spaghetti night? I'll have spaghetti night. Right. And by the way, that was one of the things that came out. Apparently there's a lot of Italian people in this particular city and this particular company. And it, maybe it's New York, something like that. And they want spaghetti night. So, all right. They all pick their favorite spaghetti place. Cause there's one on every corner apparently. And they just had, we just have it delivered. We all eat spaghetti together on Friday night. Turnout 91 people. Right. 91 people. That doesn't include the families that were there too. And it was fun because we're all eating spaghetti. Okay. It's what you want to do. Let's do it. Whatever you want to do, let's do it. So culture's easy right now. Just let go of it. You tell me, you tell us, we want you to be happy. That's number one. Number two, this is an important one. We all know you're looking. We all know that everybody in this organization is looking and everybody in every organization is looking. Good for you. Please, please, just come talk to me, us before you go, take the round three interview. If you're getting serious, we want to get serious with you. And if the feedback is, well, you should do that all along, you're right. We're failing here. Culture Club spins that up. And please, all we're asking, let us know and let us know what we can do to keep you because nothing matters more than you to us. Those conversations of, of feeling validated and valued, the retention is as important as the recruitment right now. Yeah. So More spin so. up the culture clubs, let them do what they want. Come on, let's have some fun. Let's make this fun again. But please come see us if you get to that, you know, you, you make it to that third round before you make that final commitment and just know that we care and we want to do everything we can to keep you. And if it's too late, then what did we learn? And get that exit interview queued up and really go deep and learn what went wrong. Learn from your fails. And, and, in, and when I'm working with companies, we don't lose. Lose isn't even on the vocabulary. We win or we learn. 
And the only time that we might get angry is when something that we should have learned from, we didn't take the time, energy, and effort to talk through it and learn. Because learning takes time, energy, and effort and, and has a place inside all of our cultures. So that's the work that I'm doing right now. Um, you know, TBD on some of it because it's new, uh, but so far so good. So when we talk about this big resignation, one of the things that I'm kind of noticing is there's something that I call the the uh, change index. And it's like the in order for change to take place for most people, the pain they're in has to exceed the pain of change. And until it does in their own perception, change won't take place. So now the world changed. So we went into the pandemic. All of a sudden we're working from home. We're doing all of these things and people become acclimated to that other experience. And now any change is a change. So when they're called to come back to work, that in their mind might as well be the same as being called uh, one. It could be being called to any job, right? And now they're saying, okay, I'm being called back to this job. But since I'm being called back to a job, why this job? And then the second one is almost like being, uh, it may um, not respect any growth they've achieved. So it could be by being called back to a place that uh, that they have been progressing away from. Like maybe they did a lot of self-development during COVID. You know, like some people bake bread, but some people leveled up. You know, you see some massive changes in physiques and things like that. And it could be that they're calling this person back to a job and they don't even realize they're not even calling the same person anymore. Well, but but here's the reality. Don't call them back to a job. Ask them if they'd like to come back and we'd like to have them back and here's why if you ask you get if you ask well you get more but by asking you're respecting that person's change and what it's going to take to get you back to the office okay you're not ready yet no problem could we work on maybe a 60 day plan as your leader, as your manager, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get you. You're a big part of the team. You're important to us. Really want to have that personal interaction with you. And there's five on our team and three of you are coming back. Mary's going to take some maternity leave here and, and stay on a lecture. And we're going to support her in that. And we'd like to support you on a slower comeback to respect where you're coming from. At least listen. Yeah, that, that's a big part of it as well, because just like, you know, we talked about at the very beginning, if you talk about going back, you're, you're already wrong, right? Scott just said, it's what's the, what's the new thing you've learned? What's the, so I understand you want to remain working remote or so why, why is that? What is that about that? Oh, you know what? I got to my kids events that I haven't been able to get to because of my long commute, or I was able to do this or that. Great. Let's come up with something so we can do both. How about if you can still get to your kids' events, but we can still get you in the office too? Um, if that ha that's one of the hot topics right now, and and so you can't have that discussion though. If you just say this is what we're doing, and you don't ask, as Scott pointed out, because what are people going to do? I right, I'm out. And yeah, you, you think you think about the labor markets right now. Plug in job title here, just okay. Pl pick a job title. Average number of opportunities in the place you want to go in the market. You know, just plug it, you know, is X. Right now, it's X squared at mm -hmm. least. Yep. So the yep. opportunities for everybody are double plus. I think it's two and a half times, but let's not get into the modeling here. Uh, it, that, that's what's available opportunity-wise. I have never, ever thought more about looking elsewhere than I am right now is being heard all over the world mm -hmm. yeah. listen to that so i come from like a, a marketing background and this is going to be pretty interesting because there's mechanisms at play here that weren't at play before so what we noticed is like uh we noticed an effect that i'm wondering if you guys think might be taking might about to be take place in in employment so I think it was back in like 2018 that the number of MLS transactions associated with real estate, there was eight times as many web leads in the United States. Then you fast forward that five years and it's like, uh, it's literally tripled like 24 web, uh, 24 million web leads per 1 million MLS uh, sales associated with, with web leads. 
And what the difference was is they didn't really make any more consumers. They just made more leads. They just found ways to like make like this movement and attraction, right? So now with how many people are involved in selling employment, so we're talking about the big companies uh, that do resumes and job postings and so on and so forth. I wonder how many people are uh, like how much the competition is basically leveled up because of the advertisements for jobs and companies participating in that. Yeah. Well, and here's, so you hit on something and you, you go into your earlier comment about, you know, the, the change, right? So pain you're in exceeds the pain of change, right? Is one swap out pain for excitement or engagement. Mm. The work I can go do is more exciting than the work I'm stuck doing now, right? Mm -hmm. It can be one or both of those things. So now that's, you know, in looking at all the different leads that are out there, all the different opportunities, it's not about, and I actually just chatted with somebody about this a little bit ago, you know, at the bottom of a job posting listing that you offer medical and dental and 401k, who doesn't? So don't even talk to me about the things that you do offer that nobody else does. What are the things that differentiate you? It's that culture piece, right? It's create, talk to me about that. What are the benefits that you offer culturally that are going to make somebody go like if you're, you know, supporting remote work from anywhere in the world, that's a benefit that's going to get more attention than the fact that you offer medical, you know? Totally. So like the marketing of that is part of that attraction piece and going to the culture that you want to be in, going to work you want to do that excites you versus staying somewhere where you're stuck either in pain or you're feeling trapped, there's no motion, whatever it is, right? That's all of that. Yeah, so and, and I and, and I think I think this is important to take the other side of that equation just for a second. The marketing too. Now let's talk about who we're looking to talk to. Mm -hmm. And take this box of proficiency and history of performance at A, B, and C in job title D, E, and F push it away and let's look at the character of the person that we're hiring first hire for character first proficiency second because fit the i call it a mesh the mesh in to the new job is 90 percent of the happiness you know i love who i work with i love the people around me and then i love what i do it's always the people first. If you listen, that's what you're hearing. For those of those that work at a company and leaderships, they, they and, and you know who these stakeholders are, they bleed the company colors. Man, they just love the company and they mean it, right? They're authentic. Those people, what are their character traits? Mm -hmm. Look inside your organization and find those character traits that bring the most loyalty and breed the most success and productivity and go look for those characters because in the recruiting world, it's called transferable skills. You need some transferable skills. Well, it used to be C++ and NetSuite, you know, coding. But now it's integrity. <laughs> and it's flexibility. And it's resiliency. And it works and plays well with others. Those things far exceed any proficiency that you'd be looking for regardless of how technical the job, in my opinion. And so now with companies trying to get into this level of play of recruitment, this is why I was saying it's starting to like mirror other things I partic uh, participated in. Because with my marketing company, Gravidia, we're talking to leaders about doing video because that will attract the type of talent you're talking about. When, when we say, like, how can your company be represented to the public in a way that would reveal the best talent in a time where you have the options? In a market that is saturated, right? Like right now, uh, obviously, you know, employment in the United States is a buyer's market. And so in that, in that market, your, your listing has to be very strong. And you can see this, like when I was learning how to write uh, listings uh, and taking a new approach at it,
I went and researched how to, how to make great dating profiles. Because when you take a look, they're very similar. And there's no information on writing a better MLS. And there's tons of information on writing a better <laughs> dating profile. So hey, much I, I have a, I have a Go ahead, Taylor. Sorry, I thought you were done. So much so that we actually started to uh, see about taking pictures with pets in the picture because that really hit well on dating sites. So these things are the things that I think are coming in and Gravity is tooling up to help more companies talk to uh, potential teammates. Because I got to say, if somebody great talent sees you on video and they get the cut of your jib and they get a feeling, a sense of what it's like to be, like, like even just talking to David right now uh, and talking to Scott, when you, when you hear them speak, the great things about podcasts is this is not one quote on Twitter. These guys have to go three questions deep. You can understand that when David says he has a black belt in, in Six Sigma, it's an invitation, right? Just like for someone who has a black belt in jujitsu, it's an invitation, effectively. <laughs> and the uh, it's probably not one you want, but uh, <laughs> but it says I'm free. open to being tested. Do you agree? Yeah. I, not only do I agree, Taylor, and as we wrap things up today, you know, that, that brings up my question for the two of you. And, and that's what's next. So what we're seeing is uh, adaptability to post pandemic. We're seeing the ability to hold on to our revenue growth while we struggle with our resources and that ladder rungs after we can see it now we're in it now and we're doing well. Equity markets are strong. Balance sheets are strong. Banks are still lending. Inflation is an issue, but what do you guys see next? What's the next big thing that we're going to get into for companies and for leadership within those companies? What's that next line of sight out there that maybe they're not seeing on the horizon line that they might want to pay attention to? Taylor, I'll ask that question of you first. So I really, I'm going to make a bold statement here and say that it's going to be domestic relocation and domestic uh, outsourcing. So like insourcing. So with the ebb and flow of uh, how companies are taking in money, um, we saw massive layoffs and now we're seeing the repercussions of losing talent and having to retrain them. And like the retention is when, like when you talk about client retention, companies experience a six times benefit to retain past clients as opposed to try to win new clients. And it, that's got to have like, that's got to be, you know, another level, uh, an order of magnitude when you talk about people that are uh, in, that actually work with you. So I really think that uh, companies should be considering options where they can uh, look in other markets where the cost of living isn't so high. So imagine companies in Austin, Texas right now, how much are they going to have to offer in order to th have the people be able to afford the average house there? Uh, Facebook at the time that I toured, they were offering a $15,000 bonus if you lived within five miles of Facebook because they knew it would contribute to your happiness, right? We're talking about a company that spends a billion dollars a year feeding the people coming out of university because that's who their employees are. And when these things are running into play, I think that we're going to start to see that you could have somebody in your driving, like your commuter circle. It's going to be cheaper to have them show up to those 90 day meetings from Wyoming and pay them the cost of living there. And I think the government's going to put a hard stop to some outsourcing because the demand is going to be so high. There's going to be like penalties associated. I think insourcing is going to be the new black. I love that. That's that. That is a line of sight beyond the horizon line of most leaders right now. Domestic relocation. Well said. Thank you for that, David. What do you What do you see out there from a leadership line of sight perspective that most leaders in your mind aren't paying attention to? Uh, um, honestly, from some of the conversations I've had over the past few weeks, and and in talking to the leaders that that I've worked with in my research and things, um, coaching is something that they're actually getting into. Yeah. Um, and I've actually drawn over the past probably two weeks, so many sports references with this, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, I, you take LeBron James, right? He's, he's kind of a good basketball player, right? <laughs> right? The, the guy has six coaches. He's got a nutritionist, strength and conditioning coach. He's got somebody that takes care of physical therapy and, and all of that. He's got his coach on the court. He's got his, right? a defensive specialist coach, a shooting coach, like all of these things. He's at the top of his game. You don't get to the top again alone. You have to, it's part of that culture. And the other part of it, so that's that's from the leadership's uh, element of it. And part of those conversations too, and Taylor, kind of going back to what you were talking about too, um, 
with your uh, with the recruiting piece, where is recruiting and where has recruiting for the past hundred years been cutthroat? University. Where, really? Right. If you look at how if you go back and look at some universities and how they reinvented themselves and how they do recruiting and how they create a, a culture, not only for the recruits themselves, but of their fan bases. Right. And they've got like it's about who they have coaching and who they have playing and where they're ranked and what sports they're good at and all of these things. Right. Um, they create cultures of not just fans. Of fanatics. That's mm -hmm. what you want. Scott was talking about it before. It's creating fanatics. How are you doing that piece of it? And that's, again, ties back into the coaching piece of it, right? Is who, are, who do you have to help you out at the top so that you can help your people out and you coach your people, they coach their people, right? And it's a ripple effect. And Scott, Scott and I have chatted about the ripple effect a lot. That's nobody ever makes it to the top alone. And that's the thing that's coming out more. These innovative leaders are identifying that and saying, I need somebody to challenge me. And in doing it with a coach, one-on-one -on -one behind closed doors, so you can have really candid conversations that you can't have necessarily in front of your team or with your team. And so having those conversations on a weekly basis, um, having that outside perspective and, and somebody you know, call those things out. Um, that's something I'm watching pick up more and I'm seeing more people interested in. Um, and I'm hoping more people take advantage of, frankly, uh, you know, it's needed. Says, says the newly minted doctor. <laughs> yeah, a little bit selfishly, um, but, but that's the, uh, that kind you know, those trends kind of came out of that research, right? The really top performers, so in, in terms of innovation, right, there's two brand new innovation metrics out there. They're ratios of innovation to current portfolio, right? And if you look at those, the people with the top metrics at or at above 0.9, so 90% of their portfolio is new and innovative things, right? Looking at that, those people had coaches come in and work with them and advise and keep them connected to people in new ways and kept them challenging their own assumptions so that they could innovate and they could, you know, do that. Um, so you get, get a coach and think about domestic relocation budgets because you need to look outside markets to attract great people. That's okay. powerful stuff. I appreciate that. You guys, thank you so much. You know what else, uh, uh, Taylor, as we say goodbye today is, uh, you know, sooner or later, we're going to have to get a sponsor, someone to sponsor this show. Uh, maybe there's a doctor or two out there we get to sponsor the show. Right? I've heard good things about doctor sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate you having us with us. We are here with David Freed, uh, newly minted PhD, Dr. David Freed. And what you want to take a look at in the future is Dr. David Freed teaching you how to be more cybernetic, how to help your team and your technology level up together. Uh, we're excited to have you, and I'm uh, excited to have you back. I hope you don't mind how much we uh, say come on. Uh <laughs> Anytime. I, I love these conversations. They're so stimulating. So thank you for having me back. Well, and wait, I can't, I can't wait to say it, oh. Taylor. I can't wait to say it. No, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And congratulations. We really appreciate no you sharing that with us. And no as doubt. always, I'm here with Scott Connors, Chief Change Officer of Crankset Group, helping people see, like David was talking about coaching. We're sitting here with a master coach, a couple of them actually. And uh, thank you guys both. I was uh, definitely the best. Uh, I, I had a great time. Uh, I got lots of notes here. I really appreciate you guys. My name is Taylor. I'm, ser I'm a serial entrepreneur and marketing strategist at Gravidia, where we're helping you attract your next client instead of chase them. So, and maybe attract your next cr recruit now uh, based on how competition is changing. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>